So today I'm joined by Carm Mana, CEO of Terramera. Welcome, Carm. Thank you, Scott. Pleasure All here. right. Now you've had an intriguing career to say the least. And uh, when I say intriguing is that you studied biology and biotech and you ended up founding a software startup. But then you ran in and was elected as the youngest member of the Legislative Assembly in the province of British Columbia. And then you eventually went into get your law degree and now you're working on ad tech, clean tech startup. That's a wild ride. So tell us about that. It is, it's been a, it's been a journey. I promise I'm not a dilettante. I'm not dropping all over the place. It's just, it's interesting how, where life has, has taken me. And I, I have, um, I, I will be honest. I, um, you know, I have, um, uh, some of the, some of the kind of turns in life were a little bit, uh, uh, unexpected. I actually, uh, uh, when I was running for, uh, decided to run uh, at the, in the provincial parliament. I actually didn't necessarily plan to do that. I didn't necessarily plan to start the company I'm starting. I think uh, there, there are certain things that sometimes drive us in life. And for, for me, one of those things is um, uh, being told something is impossible or it can't be done. And uh, that kind of has drawn the thread for some of the things that I, I, I've done, both starting the company in terms of, I've, you know, this really started while I was at university. Uh, on on an argument around organic farming and organic uh, uh, alternatives to synthetic chemicals that they could it could never really be uh, as effective uh, to uh, as as synthetics and that organic farming couldn't be uh, scaled in a way that was efficient to feed the world uh, and the same thing with politics actually I actually had a a position in New York that I was going to go and take uh, that was going to help me pay for law school <laughs> um, and I had been involved in in um, uh, in uh, in the Liberal Party for for some time, uh, uh, and uh, I was asked to run. It made no sense. I was, um, but uh, it was probably at the time where I was told that uh, I couldn't do it. That really was the turning of the Rubicon. <laughs> I uh, decided I I would. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's so fascinating. And I think one of the points that you're making is that sometimes uh, many of us, especially, you know, including some of the, the listeners, is that we think that this is the only way for us to achieve our goals. And what you're saying is that sometimes there is value in serendipity. There is value in allowing for, let's call it market demand or for the environment to give us signals in terms of the direction we should go. Uh, and I love the fact that it's kind of organic. That's fantastic. Now, one quick question, and then we'll get into um, you know, the genesis of your startup, is um, when you're running for political office, again, it's very different from uh, your country versus the U.S., but how does it work from a funding, and how do you actually get it up and, up and running? Um, so so it's a, it's, that's a really good um, point. I mean, um, when I decided to, to run, I, I, I'm not sure that... Uh, I had thought through all of that kind of uh, those kind of details, and you know, um, uh, I, and and w one of the truths is, even when I decided to run, um, not only had I not had funding figured out, but I was one of my deathly fears was public speaking, and so I was running straight headlong into that. Um, I remember when I had my uh, uh, first gathering of friends and family deciding that I was going to to run for the nomination for the BC Liberal Party, which is uh, the party that I ran for. Um, that I was so shaky, even though it was just a room full of, fr of friends and family that everyone else was, you know, nervous for me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, over that period of time, though, once, you know, once you decide to do something, it was, it was interesting in that, um, uh, in the moment that I decided to run, I didn't even really consider the fact that I might win, I might not win. I mean, it was, you know, um, I was giving up something, uh, you know, a position uh, in uh, that I had accepted to decide to run for a nomination for a party that I wasn't sure, uh, you know, there's no, no certainty that you're going to get it, then to be able to then run in the election to win the, the actual seat. Um, uh, but the interesting thing is, as I look backwards, I never really even considered the fact that I would lose. I mean, I, you know, it, was, it was almost like I, maybe there's kind of an arrogance in, as, as you're young to just decide, well, if I'm going to win, obviously, if I'm going to run, obviously I'm going to win. And so it was just uh, uh, really, I think, um, 
a uh, stepping backwards and saying, well, I don't know necessarily, but if I assume that I'm going to decide to do this, I'm going to win, what, do I, what am I going to have to do to get there? And uh, um, in terms of, of, of funding, um, uh, you know, I, I really had to enlist friends and family who uh, were, you know, who supported me behind it to, to help go out and, and raise some money. It was really small dollars for, for the nomination. I mean, you know, probably just a few thousand dollars. Uh, but then once I won the party's nomination, then, you know, I, I had that behind me and you could issue political tax receipts and go out to a larger community. Um, and, you know, that made a big difference. But for the nomination itself, it was, you know, I, I really just had to support myself, get people signed up to to become members of the party and uh, get them behind me. And it was, I mean, uh, at the time, it was a $10 membership to the party. So I had to go. I literally actually went door to door to get people uh, signed up and convince them why not only should they support the party, but they should support me personally and they should sign up. Uh, they should put ten dollars down to 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 do that. So that was the journey. Yeah, it's uh, it, it. This is uh, this is really interesting. And uh, one thing that you mentioned is is that you you were very afraid of public speaking, and I think um, that's something that's common to most of us, by the way. But when you set out a particular goal, you were willing to challenge yourself, and that included skill acquisition as well and putting yourself out there and of course it's a tremendous amount of courage and then the other thing you mentioned is this notion of almost like tunnel vision it's what steve jobs used to tell his uh, leadership team every day uh, make sure that you say no more often than yes and that's a kind of way of saying it's a it's a, a way for you to laser focus and in your case you said that there is no other option except winning and you make sure that every action every activity supported that win so I, I think that's a, a lot to uh, to t take away for for listeners so let's get into uh terra mera you know, i just want to i guess yes. as we bridge that point i think that's a really important one it's actually something that i i talked to our team about as well because some of the things that we're trying to do are so big hmm. and um uh it's it's one of the differences i mean my background is um, you mentioned a lot. My, my background is as a scientist. I also studied law, and it it ended up, you know, founding the company during that period of time. But my initial training was as as a scientist, and as a scientist, you don't end up um, necessarily focusing on what the end result is and working backwards. And so it was a it was really a a difference in a in a, a way of thinking about how uh, that that set of inquiry is different from how life works. And sometimes. Um, um, it's it's actually much more powerful to 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 do exactly that to suspend that disbelief and and decide that's where you're 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 actually going to get to. And I talked to our team about that quite a bit. I mean, we at Terramera, so um, you know, we're it's an uh, we're an agricultural technology company. Terramera literally means our earth. It comes from the Indian uh, words Terra and Mera, also Latin Terra, which means earth. So yours and mine, earth. And, and what we've set out to do is, is utilize the best of technology to, to, to see how we can actually um, uh, solve some of the biggest problems in, in agriculture, making agriculture much more efficient. Um, and, and so we've got these audacious goals that we call them. So um, uh, by, 20, uh, by 2030, to reduce 80% of uh, the synthetic chemicals uh, synthetic chemical pesticides that are used in agriculture globally uh, while increasing uh, productivity um, in the form of yields and quality on farm by at least 20%, which would be enough to feed a billion people. And, you know, it's when we set out these audacious goals a few years ago, I mean, one of the hardest things for people to get around is how are we actually even going to do that? And, you know, 10 years is a long period of time. You may not know exactly how you're going to get there. And that's one of the things that we had to work with uh, uh, with our, our team. And I'm constantly also talking about that. You have to suspend your disbelief that you may not be able to get there. Agree and believe that that is the outcome that you're going to get there. And then work backwards to figure out how. You know, fast forward a couple of years later, we have, you know, we still have the, you know, the 2030 goal of, of doing it. And people, you know, there's a, there's a, 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 a fairly clear pathway. Um, it's, it doesn't seem so audacious anymore. In fact, 
we, we, we may, you know, raise the bar in the next 10 years of, of what those audacious goals are because we've developed a set of technologies that at least for the first part, we have the ability to actually accomplish. Um, it's a matter of scale. Um, okay. so that's a, that's a fantastic point. And I couldn't agree with you more, uh, just to set the context for the listeners, uh, is that during, um, Karn's law school, there was some conversation that was taking place between his, he and his colleagues where they were talking about the fact that, and I think this was around the time of upcoming Vancouver Olympics, and this recognition that uh, one of the things that Olymp uh, Olympics have had uh, issues with is uh, bed bug infestation. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that a lot of these bugs are resistant to any type of synthetic chemicals. And, and of course, a lot of them don't have natural predators. So you wanted to be able to actually create this natural solution that was going to eradicate the bugs, but not necessarily have any type of toxic externality to humans or animals, much like what we're seeing uh, with commercial um, pesticides that's out there where we're starting to see evidence of serious, serious skin cancer and other types of cancer coming from it, uh, being exposed to it. And the solution that you uh, identified early on was this neem oil. Uh, so tell us about that and specifically the core IP of the product, which is the act Activate that increases mm -hmm. the efficiency of the delivery of the active ingredients. Yeah. So, I mean, this is how sometimes um, things in your life string together in an unexpected way. Um, so I had worked on, uh, uh, on, on pushing for the Vancouver Olympics while I, when, when I was um, uh, in office in, in the, the provincial parliament. Um, and, uh, at, when I was, uh, I went back to, to finish law school, I was, uh, I had an argument that, uh, around the Olympics and that there was going to be all these negative externalities that, and one of the things that a uh, friend and colleague, uh, talked about was that in previous Olympics, like, uh, in Sydney and other games in Sydney, for example, they never had bed bugs out in Australia. Uh, the, um, and after the games, they had a huge epidemic, um, where, uh, hotels and even private homes because a lot of, of people would come there and actually stay in and billet in private homes had this huge epidemic and one of the biggest problems was that these uh, that bed bugs have got had gotten resistant to synthetic the synthetic pesticides that were being used which is true um, but that there was nothing natural or biologic that could actually be effective and um, that really made no sense. And, and, and then the argument really went, went further. I mean, uh, so uh, around the supposed inferiority or, or of, of natural products and organic products. So really, I mean, Terramera, I, I founded Terramera on this argument. Didn't even plan on really starting it uh, as a company, but I founded it on an argument while I was at UBC about the supposed inferiority of natural products in it. Um, in pest control and agriculture, and whether, and and then as a corollary, whether organic farming, uh, organic and clean farming, could actually be scaled to feed the world. And um, so, when I started doing some research on um, starting with the problem of natural products for pest control, um, I, I ended up looking at some research that had been done using one of the natural. Uh, materials that are used in both pest control and in agriculture called uh, cold pressed neem. And it's actually a material that is really interesting. It's used in um, uh, Ayurvedic uh, healthcare. It's been used for thousands of years. Uh, it, it comes from a tree in India that is, is known as the village pharmacy. Mm. Um, but it also has all of these interesting properties, um, so much so that in the US in the 1990s, the National Academy of Sciences she did a report on this material saying, uh, you know, neem, a tree to solve global problems. It was really seen as this panacea that could help, um, you know, potentially replace a lot of the synthetic uh, chemical pesticides that we were using. But, th you know, that the hype never really lived up to people's hopes. And when people started using it, it, it didn't really work as well as, as, and it was very inconsistent. And so, you know, that became kind of the core of, of looking into what, you know, for, for me, was like, why, why is it that these materials are, wor are working in lab situations, but don't work when, you know, we're scaling them out for commercial uses? And I mean, it makes no sense that a biological material would be as 
less effective than a synthetic. I mean, most of the synthetics we're using today uh, never existed on the planet 100 years ago. And, you know, uh, it makes no sense that, that, you know, biologics, which have evolved over millions of years of evolution, I mean, it is, you know, the, it is the Earth's actual, you know, rapid prototyping of, of you know, iteratively seeing what's working and what's not, that these materials would inherently be less effective than synthetics. And so to, we, I really started to try to, to, to break down and, and I was curious why, why these organic materials were, were not working as effectively. And so we tried to break that down and see like, what, what is that barrier? Because the market around, you know, there's about 70 to $80 billion that are spent on pesticides every year. It's a huge amount that are used and 97% of the market is synthetic. So the market is saying that the synthetics are more effective than biologics, but evolution says biologics should be just as effective. And so what, what is that gap? And so we really started to try to break that down. Um, one of the key things that we looked at was the difference of, of how the, the natural materials evolved. They were very large and complex materials and very large and complex um, uh, uh, molecules compared to the small uh, synthetic molecules that we were able to synthesize. And so one of the key things we focused on was how you, you know, get these large complex materials taken up more effectively. Um, and what we started looking at was, you know, is the uptake of these materials one of the biggest problems? If you could actually increase the uptake into the organism that you're trying to re to, to deliver it into, whether it's a bug or a disease, and actually get it taken up more effectively into cells, uh, would that make it more effective? And the answer is it could, and it was uh, transformational. We could take you know, organic materials that were seen as snake oils and, uh, and really had poor efficacy and make them as effective as, as synthetics. And that was the genesis of this set of technologies we call Actigate. And what Actigate does is it, it increases the availability of the materials we're using. And so with or natural and organic materials, we can actually take uh, those materials that are poor performing and have them um, be taken up more effectively to the level where they're as effective as synthetics. Um, and with synthetic materials, we can actually um, reduce the, the amount that's required in, con in conventional farming with, um, by up to 90%. Um, because a lot of what we're actually using, what happens is we, we take these materials and we mix them up with, you know, into solutions and we're spraying them um, to the area we're treating, like on a farm. And, you know, 50 to 90% of everything that we, split, we, we, we apply and spray on a farm is washed away into the soil and water. It doesn't get to where it's needed. It's kind of like, you know, having a headache and taking a shower in aspirin water rather than taking the aspirin. I mean, most of that, eventually you would, you would absorb enough into your skin uh, to, to get rid of that headache, but most of it would be wasted. It would be dissolved in the water washing over you going down the drain. And essentially that's what we do in agriculture. So if we can take what we're, we're doing and have less of it wasted through and have more of it actually absorbed to where it needs to get to, we can make the entire system much more effective. And that's what Actigate does in a way that uses natural materials, that uses uh, materials that just are, you know, inert materials that just help that increase that uptake. And, and um, again, we don't have enough time to get into the, the details of the science, but when you say the uptake, is it the, the kind of the binding where the, the substance basically adheres to the crop uh, in such a way, like you said, whether it's raining or, or whatever the conditions are, it doesn't wash away, but it, it remains on that plant so that there is that uh, efficacy that is longer term. Um, so it's actually more like the material is available to the right place. Okay. An easy way to probably understand this is like if if you think about foods that you eat, like vitamins, or there's you know turmeric has has been talked about a lot as a, a powerful natural anti-inflammatory. But if you take a whole bunch of turmeric, almost all of it is going to just go through your system. Your body mm -hmm. won't absorb it. Um, but if you take it with some black pepper, it, it actually increases it. that the amount that's taken up. The same with vitamins. So a lot of vitamins are fat soluble. If you just drink vitamin water and you don't have any fat in the system, the, it's, it's all just literally going to just go right through your system. Mm. But, but there are materials that help increase that 
uptake and the bioavailability. So when you actually are applying it, it actually gets taken up to where it needs to get to rather than just being washed through the system and wasted. All right, got it. And in that portion, uh, do you have a, a set of patent portfolio that yeah. protects that? Because again, uh, this is the kind of stuff that Monsanto doesn't want to see in the marketplace. So we actually have over 195 patents Perfect. and it is focused on, uh, on how you more effectively deliver uh, the materials we're using. And that's really what allows us to then uh, go out and work with different folks that are, are uh, making products um, for, for farmers to use and allow them to use this technology and license this technology to make their products more efficient. Yeah. Now, we don't have enough time to get into the, the logic of how this actually aids in the scale, scaling and the production of organic foods, because I think it's fairly simple logic. But let's talk a little bit about kind of the, the change uh, in terms of the resistance to behavioral change uh, for mm -hmm. farmers. Because uh, I remember seeing studies as well as seeing interviews where farmers are, some of them are so adamant that synthet synthetic pesticides are absolutely necessary uh, and it's something that they cannot live without, regardless whether it has cancerous effects or not, uh, they absolutely believe in it. Um, so that is one issue. The other issue is there's just a general resistance to change, but at the same time, there is the kind of bigger robotics, AI applications that's coming to ad tech. Yeah. Who within kind of agricultural spectrum of target segments are your solution ideal for where there is least amount of resistance? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that uh, I think is really important as you're trying to change a system is there's, there's uh, kind of two ways to do it. You can either try to outright disrupt and say, I'm gonna just try to take over the system with a completely different way. I don't agree with how it's going. Or what I believe is, you know, I'm a big fan of the, of the uh, Aikido, uh, set um, uh, uh, principles and, and that, you know, that you use the energy of a system and help use, move with that energy to change the direction of it. And so that's one of the, the things that we are trying to do right now is, is say, okay, we can use this technology to, to make organic materials much more effective so that there's better tools. Because right now what those farmers are saying is, if I lose those synthetic tools, there is nothing else and we need to feed the world and it doesn't make any sense to have, you know, to have, uh, to take, get rid of those tools without a replacement because we're gonna lose most of our crop. Um, and so we, we need to make um, better, more efficient organic tools and we're using Actigate to, to do that. But at the same time, when 97% of the market is synthetic, uh, we need to make those, to bring down the amount of those conventional products as well. And the reality is they trust those products. And so what we need to do is also work with, with them and say, okay, look, let's first bring down, let's use this technology to, to and if you're using you know, uh, a gallon of it, let's bring that down so that you, we start with using only a tenth of a gallon. Um, and, then, and then start building in that trust, um, uh, you know, you know, taking away 90%, 90 you know, uh, right away is a huge uh, an effect on the, on the system. And then as we start doing that, start building up the trust with, with uh, these technologies and get more you know, uh, natural and organic products out to the market as additional tools that they can also trust and use. And then you know, we actually are also looking at trying to show farmers because to move beyond, to, to show farmers how it's actually working. So once they actually use it, they move beyond the belief systems because what you're talking about is a you know what there exists in a lot of industries and and including in farming is there's a belief system that you know when those farmers say if i get rid of that, um these these synthetics it, you know i'll lose my farm because uh there's nothing else that works well that may or may not be true but but that's actually coming a lot from a belief system that that is that is mm. uh the case so what we're trying to do is replace that with data so um you know go with the system you're using right now, make it more efficient, and then use the data to see what else is working. And we're trying to, in kind of in parallel, uh, introduce systems that use machine learning, machine vision, AI, that actually, uh, that, that actually um, 
document how each of the different products, whether they're synthetic or organic, whether they're enabled with Actigator or not, how they're actually working to enhance, to reduce loss and enhance the, the quality and yields. And so that we can actually make decisions based on facts and data and farmers can make decisions based on facts and data. Uh, and eventually they can actually, once they can develop trust into the system, um, use it to make better decisions because they trust that system will actually increase their profitability and yields. Uh, so let's um, let's let me ask some uh, let me ask kind of a so somewhat of a what if what if scenario question is that if in fact you guys are able to continue to mature and develop this and increase the the up uptake um, on the efficacy of this. Uh, it's a blue ocean. It really is. And it's clear that you will capture significant market share. But that also means that there's a lot of competitors, uh, hostile competitors, that's going to be aiming for your, aiming for your head I mean, as, as a target. And they may come at you at, at many different angles, uh, including uh, outright litigation, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you have a law degree and that's helpful. Uh, other cases, they may want to acquire you uh, so mm -hmm. that they can essentially hide the patents in a vault and never see it again. Mm -hmm. And then you got new competitors that have their own set of patents, but essentially have figured out that, hey, this is something we can do as well. So how are you thinking about this as you carve out an entirely new market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, we we've, we've have tried to bring in some of the, the world's best thinkers, both from existing industry um, uh, as well as from outside of the industry. So you know, our, our uh, the the um, chair of our strategic advisory committee was the, the the head of McKinsey globally, really thinking systems wide about how you can you can bring these technologies and 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 you know have the best strategies and business models to be able to scale with it. And um, we also have someone who headed up Bayer, and Bayer is a company that acquired Monsanto and and heading up who headed up Bayer's um, uh, R and D. Um, and and so we're trying to bring in the the, the thinkers from the industry and uh, and some of the best strategists. And I think what what our goal is to say, how do we build this instead of fighting uh, and 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 creating a you know a toxic environment? Um, actually, collaborate mm -hmm. so that everyone wins. And there are business models that that do that. We're we're just so used to um, a model that you know someone has to win and someone has to lose. What if, you know, you know, can we actually transcend that? If we're trying to make the whole system more effective, can we make it so that you actually have the producers win, the farmers win, and the environment wins, and are there business models? And when you ask questions that way, it actually, we, you actually come up with answers that, that, uh, that are, you know, a, a greater win that uh, um, are, are not so, um, you know, divisive. And I think that's how we're, we're trying to start this. I mean, I make no mistake, my goal, like my goal in life is to try to, to go actually beyond organic to, to regenerative farming and make, figure out how to make that, that uh, uh, economical. We, we're not quite there yet. If we can get there, it has huge impacts on our health, our nutrition and the planet and on climate change. If we were to, to, to switch the entire world's farming to regenerative farming, we would just from that one thing, you would solve the climate crisis we're in. We would roll back it, um, uh, the amount of emissions. It, farming could actually um, sequester so much carbon over a trillion mm -hmm. uh, uh, tons of, of, of carbon that we could actually stop the problems that we're facing right now. But it's a very difficult process to be able to get, to get there. And if we're gonna get there, we need to use the energy of the system. And instead of, of being in a position where, you know, Monsanto or, you know, Bayer or any of these other, any companies look at us as a competitor, I think what we need to do is collaborate to make the system better and, uh, and find business models to do that. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to do. All right, so we're out of time. So today I've been joined by Karin Mana, CEO of Terra Mera. Karin, thank you for joining. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me.